Good morning, gentlemen. It is indeed a pleasure to be at Amen Bible Study. Uh, glad you're all keeping up the study and going through books of the Bible together, uh, which, you know, I, I love to do with you. I, we're not doing that today. I, you're studying in John. Uh, I'd love to study John with you, but I've been given another assignment, which I'm very happy to, to take with you. We'll be looking at several texts in the scriptures. Well, if you've been wondering what I've been doing for the past seven years, just been watering the grass, you know, raking leaves, uh, you know, been an uh, interim pastor for a couple of churches and now serving as uh, interim president for the Gospel Coalition. I appreciate your prayers for us. We have a lot of work to do and we've been doing a lot of work and we, we had 26 million users on our website last year. So obviously uh, we have a lot going on and have a wonderful staff, uh, but we just appreciate your prayers during these days. Well, uh, when I was a, by the way, when, when Mike said that uh, we grew up together, no, Mike, you all were old men when you started 25 years ago. Uh, a little late for you guys, but it sure was fun talking about old age together for 25 years. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to use a phrase. She would say, son, you've forgotten your manners. It could be, uh, you remember, uh, those of you who are old, you'll remember that it used to be that when you're sitting at the dining room table, that's a guy, younger guys, that's a table that you usually have in a separate room where the family sits together for a meal. But uh, if you're in the dining room table and you, you're through with your meal and you just get up and leave the table, that's not good manners. You're to ask dad if you may be excused. Do you remember that, Price? And so if I would get up, just get up, my mom would say, you're forgetting your manners. Uh, or if I didn't take my plate back, that was worse. Uh, or, you know, in, in my older age, when I didn't write a thank you note, you've forgotten your manners. Uh, it was just a common phrase. And I, I think uh, if my mom were alive today, she might say to the evangelical church, you've forgotten your manners, because we have in so many ways. And what I've noticed in looking at the scriptures is that what we used to think of being relatively superficial in our external conduct or conduct in social settings, that it was just sort of our regional traditions and so on, uh, and we called it good manners. Uh, what I, I realize when I'm studying the Bible is that manners are actually uh, essential to our Christian faith and conduct, that it's one of the expressions of who we are, uh, that it, all these manners, the, these external uh, uh, behaviors come from uh, an identity of who we are and how we want to behave and actually who we're copying. And so these past uh, six or seven years, as you all know, have been uh, so difficult for our country and it's been very difficult for the church. Uh, you've heard the figures that probably about 40% of, of evangelical pastors have seriously contemplated leaving Christian ministry. And I have to admit, over these past seven years, it happened to me for about a month. I actually thought about it. Um, but then I realized that during times like this, uh, we don't retreat. This, of all times, is when we press forward and invite others to do the same. So, you know, I've had my own little pity party. But uh, pastors have a lot of pity parties because of the lack of manners in the church. It's not so much in the world. It's in the church. The manners have become so bad that it becomes difficult to lead and to shepherd people. So I would like to look with you at this because we all know what's been happening in our country with the partisan uh, animosity. You know, the, the numbers now, they reflect what Republicans think of Democrats and what Democrats think of Republicans are extraordinary. It's about up the 40% level where Republicans think that Democrats are actually doing our country a disservice and vice versa. Democrats feel the same way. Uh, there are now uh, people talking seriously, about 10-15% of our population, about segregating uh, red and, and blue states, something that we had really never heard much of since the Civil War. Uh, and there are some studies that show that we are increasingly becoming isolated by our thought groups. In fact, even neighborhoods now. Uh, New York Times has a, a um, mechanism whereby you can go on and find out what the politics of your neighborhood is. 
And what you'll find is most neighborhoods are very dominantly Democratic or very dominantly Republican. Uh, it's because we're what they call sorting out. So whether it's schools or neighborhoods, sometimes even the workplace, we're sorting out by our partisan uh, favoritism. And then what happens is uh, studies have shown that once you get in your own group and you're dominantly living and talking and working with people who agree with you, you become more extremist in your views and you become more demeaning of those with whom you disagree. It's a phenomenon that's very recognized now by sociologists. And furthermore, some evangelicals have done recent studies to study the evangelical movement, those of us who believe that the Bible is the word of God and Christ is the only way of salvation and so on, some of these key doctrines that we hold to. And they're finding that evangelicals are among the most separatist uh, in terms of their social conduct of almost any group in the country. So as an evangelical, of course, that hits me between the eyes. And it explains a lot of what's going on in the church. So I'd like to just say, can we consider our manners for just a few moments together this morning about how we navigate uh, through this sort of uh, cultural crisis, how we can be different, how we can be, as Mike said a moment ago, uh, not just the people that your Bible teacher wants you to be. We want to be the people that our real Bible teacher, the Lord Jesus, wants us to be. What does he want us to be in this time and season with the challenges that are before us? Uh, I've felt, uh, as a matter of fact, that in the church, uh, the evangelical church, that one of the greatest moral crises is to learn how to get along with each other when we disagree. Uh, it is really ever before us. And we're in the middle of it, and we've not figured it out as a group. And so I want to challenge those of us who are here to begin to figure it out and to figure out how we're going to conduct our own lives and how we're going to interact with others when they misbehave. Because you know as well as I do that when you're in the church, it's not just your personal conduct that you're concerned about. Now, if you're a member of a church, you are concerned about the conduct of that entire church. That now becomes a burden on your heart. It becomes a responsibility in your life. And obviously, we can't control other people, but we influence other people. And what we must do is to conduct our own lives, which includes the influence that we're trying to have on other people. So I'd like for you to look with me at Titus 3, uh, just as one text that we could consider. We'll be looking at several texts. But Titus is such a wonderful letter. Uh, it would be great for us to take time to go through the whole letter. We could just take the morning to read that letter together, and it would be worth our time. But would you look at chapter 3, and let's look at verse 1 and 2 in particular. Paul says to Titus, who, of course, you know, Paul discipled Titus, just like he did Timothy, and he was putting them into ministry. They were now church planters, and they were representatives of the apostle uh, in those church plants. So he writes to him saying, remind them, that is the people there, to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle. And look at this phrase. And to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Perfect courtesy toward all fellow Republicans. No. Perfect courtesy toward all people. There's the standard. Now Paul goes on, as he almost always does, to give the rationale. And the rationale is, look at verse 3, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Son, Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus 
Christ our Savior, so on. So here's what Paul is saying. Because of what Jesus has done for us, because he forgave us for our hatred and our stupidity and our disobedience and our unkindness and our foolishness toward one another, because he's washed all that away and he saved us from it all. Now, our logical response is to conduct ourselves toward others in the same way in which he conducted himself toward us. That's the big challenge. And believe me, brothers, it's a big challenge. In a day when people are listening to news uh, outlets, only those that agree with their political viewpoints, and you realize that we, we always knew, uh, even 40 years ago, that there was, if you're a, 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 a political conservative, you've known for years that the mainstream media had a liberal bias to it, and it's easily understandable. All you have to do is look at the surveys of people who are actually giving us the news, and they're 90 percent uh, politically liberal. So what do you what do you expect? But those on the conservative side have known for decades that the mainstream news had a liberal bias to it. But now, of course, you know, over the past 20 or 30 years, we've taken this to another level altogether so that now the main news services that people read and listen to are propagandists. They're not just biased. They're propagandists, which means they're actively supporting a political agenda. Now, in the old days, the mainstream news was politically biased, but they never would have admitted it. They never would have said we're promoting an agenda or promoting candidates. Now, unabashedly, that's precisely what they're doing. So uh, I, I told a, a congregation uh, within the past seven years, uh, I won't say which one, I told a congregation one Sunday morning, I said, so you stopped reading your Bibles. And they looked at me because they're, they're a congregation that really believes in studying the Bible. They looked, I said, no, I, I can tell you stopped you stopped reading your Bible. Oh, you're wondering how I can tell that. Well, because uh, I can tell instead of reading your Bible, you're listening to Tucker Carlson and Rachel Maddow. And the reason I can tell is that you're acting like them and not like Jesus. You talk like them. You've got the same concerns they have. Your concerns are largely political and cultural. And I don't hear a concern about the kingdom of heaven, which has been what Jesus talked about a lot. Uh, or about the advancement of the cause of Christ, which is what Paul talked about a lot, and the New Testament talks about, I can tell what you're listening to now, and it's not the Bible. So don't think for a moment that, uh, our, uh, that our, we're getting away with this. Uh, we are imaging those that we're listening to. So I want to talk about how we navigate during times like this when I think the credibility of the evangelical church is at stake. The credibility of the church of Jesus Christ is at stake because we've forgotten our manners. So you'll notice also in the scriptures, I've put in there, for example, Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, I, I as a prisoner of the Lord urge you to walk in a manner. See the word manner? A manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. So we're to walk in a manner, a way. And manners are ways, ways of living and ways of relating. So that's what I want to speak about this morning is manners. Now, you may attribute this talk of mine to being a middle child of a scrupulous mother or to my enculturation in Southern society, both of which are true. But I hope to make the case that good manners is of the essence of Christian character. Manners are a constituent component of Christian conduct. So I want to speak about four manners that seem to have been forgotten by the, by the church of Jesus Christ that I think are worth our consideration. This is Roman numeral number one. We must listen respectfully. We must listen respectfully. And you know, it goes without saying, those of you who know me well, you know that I need to learn all these manners, and my mother would be, I hear my mother's voice talking to me right now. Uh, I'm not the perfect fulfillment of any of these concepts, but I'm looking at the scriptures and trying to teach both you and me. Uh, 
Listening applies, first of all, to our relationship with the Lord. Think about it. If we're to walk faithfully with Him, we've got to listen. We have our complaints. We come with our prayers of intercession. We're begging Him to do certain things. But the most important thing we do in that relationship is listen to His voice. Listen, listen, listen. In Isaiah, you get it 15 times. Listen to the Lord. Be still, says the psalmist, and know that I am God. Jeremiah also emphasizes it. And then in studying John, for example, in John chapter 18, verse 37, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Jesus says, I can tell you who my disciples are. They listen to me. But listening is also horizontal. And that's the reason I've, I've cited these scripture texts. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. He listens. So do you have some peers, people your age, who get into your stuff and know what you're doing and have advice for you? Do you listen? Do you have older mentors who've been through probably what you're going through? Uh, unless you get to be my age and the, the crowd starts thinning out a little bit. But do you listen to them? But by listening, do you actually take seriously what they're saying and their perspective? Uh, Solomon also said to his sons, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. James puts it this way, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Solomon says there is a time to keep silence and a time to speak. Now, in listening to someone, we have to be sure we know exactly what the other person is saying, what they are not saying, and why they are saying it. What are they saying? What are they not saying? And why are they saying it? That's listening so that you and I should be able to say to someone with whom we disagree, can I just try to articulate what you've been saying to me? And then please tell me if I got it. So you might check yourself that way to be sure that you're hearing what the other, the other person is saying. Because once again, on Fox and, and CNN, people are talking past each other all day long and all night long. They do not listen to each other. As a matter of fact, you'll notice that Fox and CNN systematically exclude voices of those who would disagree with the person they're interviewing. I've said to senators and congressmen uh, over the past several years, if you really want to help this situation out, insist that you, if you ever get interviewed on the news, that you do it in the presence of one of your political opponents and you both get interviewed together. If you really want to stop contributing to this problem as politicians, you can blame the media. But if you, want to, if you want to bring this to an end, you just insist that every interview include a Democrat and a Republican on the same issue. And that way, those of us who are citizens can actually hear the full case. So the news media will not listen to the other side. The question is, will you? And when you find out what they're saying, and don't overstate it, don't caricature them, find out what they're not saying. And then find out why. What's the real concern here? Uh, you know, the, those of us who are Catholics or uh, evangelicals um, with sort of traditional Christian viewpoints, we find ourselves on the opposite side of Planned Parenthood, for example, as an organization, constantly. Uh, they're, they're in favor of promoting abortion among young people. We're in favor of not having abortion. But sometimes, you know, the tragedy is we don't even listen to each other. So some years ago, I, I went to, to lunch with the, the director of Planned Parenthood. I want to be, be sure I understand exactly what they're saying, what they're not saying, and why they're saying it. And there were some insights I gained from talking with someone who is obviously a moral opponent of mine. This we have to do more and more to be sure that we're listening carefully. This requires concentration, curiosity about the other person's point of view, clarification 
of what they're saying. And most of all, it requires love. We must learn how to ask good questions to bring out of the other person what they're saying, what they believe, what they don't believe, and why they believe it. Obviously, if you're engaged in uh, racial justice, there must be some very, very careful listening because all sides have caricatured the other side. They think they know what they're thinking, and sometimes you don't know really what they think. You think you know because you've created a straw man with whom you can disagree and you can destroy that straw man. You haven't really debriefed a real person to find out what they believe, what they don't believe, and why they believe what they believe. And when we do listen carefully in racial justice, we'll find more racial justice promoted in our community. Marriage, come on now, you know that you make these quick assumptions about what she's thinking until you stop and actually ask her why she's holding the view that she does, and what her concerns are. And crossing that gender gap takes a lot of skill and a lot of time and energy. Well, just realize that all your neighbors require this. All we're talking about is the second great commandment, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And you can't be thrown off by personal criticism, and you can't return personal criticism or unkindness when it's given to you. Otherwise, you'll never be able to do the Jesus thing. Jesus was constantly criticized unjustly, and he moved right through the unjust criticism to build a bridge to talk with other people about the most important things. So if you're put off by being stereotyped by somebody else or criticized by somebody else and you want to return it in vengeance, you'll never be able to do the Jesus thing. So we must listen respectfully uh, to other people. I remember... Uh, this is years ago before all the security systems were in airports, for which I'm grateful. But uh, I remember I was flying through Asheville. Or no, I was flying from Asheville to go back to Boston, where I lived at the time. And uh, just in the airport, and I noticed a plane was deplaning. Of course, in those days, you just come down the steps of the plane right through the lobby into your car. You know, no big deal. And uh, I noticed that the people coming off the plane... Uh, you couldn't see them because there was a crowd of people backing up and taking pictures. So obviously some sort of celebrity had just gotten off the plane. Well, indeed, it was none other than Billy Graham coming home. So he had landed in Asheville. But what was more interesting was the person who was with him, Muhammad Ali. What do you think they talked about? What kind of questions do you think Billy asked him? Uh, what, what do, they, what, do you think Billy was kind to him? Do you think, you think they were reasonable with each other? Do you think they listened carefully? I suppose they did. And this is the way it's done, Christian brothers. We've got to be the best listeners on the planet. Secondly, this is Roman numeral two on your outline. We must reason carefully. We must reason carefully. Uh, one of Todd Erickson and my uh, good friends is Andy Lewis. And I was talking to Andy one day about these sort of things and and he said, Todd, he said, uh, I assigned a book for the session to read uh, just a few months ago, How to Think by Helen Jacobs. <laughs> just a book on how to think. Because we realize more and more that thinking is a moral exercise. Uh, if you've been trained in, um, in parochial school or Christian school, or Christian higher education, you know that thinking is a moral exercise. What are your presuppositions? Do you think reasonably? Do you put A together with B and B with C and C to D and so on? And what I'm hearing is massive irrationality, uh, not only on the TV news, but I'm hearing massive irrationality in the church. I'll just give you one example. Uh, on a Good Friday, a few years ago, I was preaching. And of course, we're talking about Jesus and the cross and about Pilate and his being examined before Pilate and all of that. And at one point, I said in my sermon, Pilate was sort of the Putin of his day. And it, that was all I said. And then I went on and talked about the interaction with Pilate and Jesus. After the message, uh, a quite senior man came up to me 
Still had his right mind, I could tell. He was still able to think, but he was old. Uh, and he said to me, uh, Pastor, I really appreciated your Good Friday sermon, except for one thing. I said, what's that? And he said, you're throwing Putin under the bus. I looked at him and I said, I didn't throw Putin under the bus. I threw Pilate under the bus. Pilate was a far better man than Vladimir Putin. Uh, Putin is just an atrocious murderer of the first order, and he's doing it on a colossal scale. A pilot never did that. And he said, well, don't you know that, that Putin has a cross around his neck and that he's a serious member of the Orthodox Church? I said, yes, I know. That makes him worse. He is one of the worst hypocrites on the planet. And in the name of Jesus Christ, he is murdering thousands of Ukrainians. I mean, I, I just, I was stunned. And uh, then uh, I said something that uh, I, I didn't follow uh, what I'm teaching today. Uh, I said, I, I'm afraid, sir, I think you're off your rocker. Um, the church is off its rocker. Now, why would this man have done that? Well, you know, the real conservative, alt-right stuff, following uh, sort of Trump's favoritism toward strong men, including Putin, had adopted the idea that this was the right thing to do is support Putin. I didn't ask him what he thought about Kim Il-sung, but uh, so it's just allowing your mind to be co-opted by a political figure or a political movement. So as we've looked back, for example, even more commonly uh, here in our political arena where uh, folks were accused of violating uh, uh, proper elections and counting ballots and all of that, and that the, some were saying, many were saying angrily that the election was stolen. And honestly, when we look back, gentlemen, I mean, when I'm trying to look at the facts, uh, there's no court in the land, and a bunch of them tried this case, no court in the land that found any reasonable violation of, of voting practices, and yet you have a group of people who just will not come off of that. Why? because of their devotion to a political figure and what they consider to be a political movement. Now, I understand pagans do those sorts of things. Christians don't. The Christian mind is a critical mind. It assesses everything that moves and everything that exists in light of the Word of God. Everything. So at the same time that we're to be the kindest people on the planet, we're the most critical thinkers on the planet. The Christian mind is a precious commodity. It's unique. Nobody else thinks like a Christian thinks. Nobody else influences like a Christian influences. We're salt and light. Nobody else is. Jesus said to his disciples, you're the salt, you're the light. You're distinctive. You're the one that brings savor to the meat. You're the one that brings brightness to the dark. dark. Which means we criticize everything, starting with ourselves, our family, our churches, our political party. So if you want to be politically critical, begin with your own party. That's what Christians do because... You begin where you have the most influence. And if you're a Democrat, you have most influence in the Democratic Party. If you're a Republican, you have most influence in the Republican Party. And if you can't think of anything to criticize, please come and talk to me. I'll give you a few suggestions about either one of your parties. That's the Christian mind. The Christian mind is not to be co-opted by anything else, especially secular movements Secular political movements. And both the Republican Party and the Democrat Party are secular movements. The mind cannot be co-opted. Now we may agree with a platform in somebody's, or with a plank in someone's platform, and you may decide to vote for a particular candidate because of a viewpoint they have that you think is consistent with the Christian faith. That's being critical. That's good. But fully to endorse someone when they're 
at least 50% of the time wrong, unbiblical, is a misuse of your mind. You've, you've lost your mind. You've given it away to a movement instead of giving it to Christ and asking Him to give it back to you. This is the big concern. We've forgotten how to reason. And so what's happened in culture and now in the church is that we've become tribal robots. We tend to identify with these movements, political and cultural movements, and then we realize no nuances are allowed. So if I'm going to be a Democrat, I must agree with everything the Democrats say. I cannot pull a plank out of their platform. Otherwise, they'll look at me and say, you're not a real Democrat. The Republicans do the same thing. You're not a real Republican when you pull one plank out of the platform. Christians, listen to me, gentlemen. We're the ones who are willing to be marginalized by both parties for the sake of truth. And so if a movement does not want a thinker in their movement, we can't be members. Or, I'll put it this way, because I do believe in being involved in politics. I'll be talking with the women more about this tonight. Uh, former congressman, a congresswoman, Martha Roby, is coming tonight for a panel with the women. I think the men are invited too if you want to come. And we'll talk about political discourse in our day. But we need to be prepared to be marginalized by both the left and the right in culture. And it's a, it's a horrible place to be. It's painful. And what's happened is Christians have been unwilling to stand there and take fire from both sides. And so they'll go ahead and identify like a robot with a secular movement. And they've lost their minds. So Paul says, or it is said of Paul in Acts chapter 19, he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Did they all agree with him? No. He's talking to a Jewish synagogue. Do you think all of them would be persuaded? No, they weren't. So he gets kicked out or he leaves. And what does he go? He goes to the lecture hall of Tyrannus and begins to preach to the pagans. He gave the Jews the first chance and then he goes to the pagans. Is he whimpering and complaining and talking about being a victim? No, he's just going where the Lord's leading him. But he's going to stand on the truth. And Christians these days must stand on the truth. Notice what James said in that main text I've given you, chapter uh, 3, verse 17. But the wisdom from above, the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason. That means, if you're open to reason, that you're malleable. You can still be shaped. You can say to someone with whom you have a conflict or a disagreement, you know, I grant that point. You're correct on that. I was wrong on that one. That's being reasonable, open to reason, flexible, changeable. Um, and Paul said to the Philippians, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. We should be known for our ability to think because we're Christians. That doesn't mean that we're more intellectually gifted than other people. Not at all. It means that we're morally gifted by the work, the washing of the Holy Spirit who has now enabled us to think clearly, biblically, critically. So we listen respectfully, we reason carefully. Thirdly, we must disagree agreeably. Those of you who've been elders or deacons at second, you've been through this before. We talk about how we conduct ourselves in group settings. And so often you'll have someone who's in a leadership role who will take great pride in himself and say, you know, I don't play these political games. I don't like politics. I just tell it like it is. When a guy says that, I'm usually saying, yeah, you probably do tell it like it is with very little concern for your neighbor. Uh, Christians are concerned about two things, the truth and love. Paul says in Ephesians 4, we are to minister the truth in love. We are to be gaining expertise in both. Tact 
is an expression of neighbor love. Some of you are just, I mean, you amaze me with your tact. You, you just seem to have a natural knack for it. Just diplomacy, kindness, tact. Some of you, maybe not. <laughs> but all of us, no matter what our starting point is, we're to gain expertise in tact. So I mentioned a few things here. If we're disagreeing agreeably before the meeting, if we're Christians, if this is a Christian meeting, I'm not talking about a civil court. Uh, you, you don't abide by these same principles. But in a meeting of Christians, we inform our opponents of our views ahead of time. We don't caucus against one another. We caucus with one another. So, for example, if you're on a leadership team in the church and there are eight of you and three of you, you know, really feel strongly about something, it's tempting for the three of you to go off and have lunch, talk about your strategy against the other five and how you're going to get your way. Christians think differently. Now, this is in Christian leadership in the church I'm talking about because the church is a family. If the three of you want to have lunch together, and if you want to talk about that issue, that's great. But you invite the people that you disagree with to the lunch. And you talk in front of them. You don't create sides in a family. Now, once again, uh, in civil litigation, <laughs> I understand. You do caucus and you have private confidential conversations and strategies that you don't share with your opponent. Let me tell you why. Because civil courts are concerned with adjudicating issues of property. And they do a pretty good job of it. And we trust them to do a good job there, to adjudicate based on property. The church is concerned about justice with property, but also relationships and reconciliation. Civil court has no interest in that. That's not part of their task. They don't care if plaintiff and defendant take vacations together afterwards. That's not their concern. Church does. So when we're in church settings, we're not trying to win an argument on your church leadership group. You're trying to lead the group to the wisest decisions, which means the wisest decision may be that they disagree with your point. However, by the fact that you expressed it, you helped them out. So you're contributing to the outcome even if you don't win the argument in church settings. We seek consensus and compromise. So that's before the meeting. During the meeting, you can see that when you disagree with someone, you first of all thank them for the things that you agree with that they've stated. And you say, look, I appreciate this and this and this. I think we're on the same page trying to accomplish this. Uh, I would suggest that we consider a, a little bit different point of view, maybe a better way to get where I think you're trying to go. You see how tactful that is? I'm, a, I'm claiming common ground with my opponent. I'm can't claiming a common vision with my opponent, if we have the same vision. And then I'm suggesting an alternative. So often in church leadership meetings, people just think they're exercising great truth by just criticizing everything. They don't ever have any substitute motions. They don't have any other alternatives. They just criticize everybody else's viewpoints. Any idiot can criticize another person's viewpoint. It takes a Christian mind to try to wrap your mind around what's going on and to offer an alternative and then let other people criticize your bonehead idea. Uh, so, and we give clear rationale for our thinking so that people can criticize our rationale. If you don't give rationale, you're just trying to pull a power play. You know, I'm 72 years old. I've been around for a while. I think you ought to listen to me. No. I give my viewpoint. I say, here's why I think this. Now I'm inviting you to criticize my thinking, not just my position. And so we don't bully people into decision making. We work through thinking reasonably and sharing that reasoning with them. And then at the end of the day, after the meeting, you notice in a church meeting, okay, so you, you are on the minor, minoritarian side. You, your, your issue, your opinion did not prevail. Most of the time in church meetings, um, when we differ, it's not a clear moral issue. It's an issue of discernment and wisdom and preference. And therefore, it's not unethical for you to fold in your hand and not only surrender the point, but now support the point. I remember, uh, Todd, you'll remember this years ago. Uh, 
we, we had a, a, a kerfuffle on session, a disagreement. And in one of those rare moments, it happened to me about four or five times in my 22 years, I ended up on the minority. Uh, you, that didn't usually happen with me in the session. We usually worked very closely together. But uh, after that was over, after that discussion was over, I took the opportunity to say, hey, those of you who are on the non-prevailing side, like moi, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make this decision the best decision we've made all year. We're going to make it work great. So that's the way that you're to do in a church group, really any group, any working group. You give your opinion, yes, in the ways that we described. When the day is over, you help support the outcome. Um, so that's Roman numeral uh, three. We must disagree agreeably. Lastly, we must reconcile fully. We must reconcile fully. Gentlemen, I think uh, in the Church of Jesus Christ, this is to be one of our areas of expertise. And here's why. We have the only solution for being reconciled to God. Every human being is a sinner. Every human being is under His judgment. There's one way to, to come out from under His judgment and to be in His blessing and to be adopted by Him as a son. And that's through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. We have the secret of reconciliation with God. Nobody else on the planet has it. And that's the reason that our mission is so urgent here in Memphis and around the world because there is no way to be saved apart from faith in Jesus Christ and particularly in His shed blood and His righteousness given to us. That's the gospel. We are experts at that. We're the only ones who have it. Now because of that, we become experts in horizontal reconciliation because Paul explains the reason we are reconciled to one another, once again, is through the blood of Jesus Christ, Ephesians 2. So it's His shed blood that has made one man out of the two. When I look at the atrocities this past two weeks in Israel by Hamas, and now I look at the destruction that's going to be taking place among the Gazans uh, as, as Israel tries to clean out Hamas, and there's already huge collateral damage. We can all see it coming. And then you can think about, you know, one thing I'm praying for is that those who are trying to clean out a, a, a huge nest of Hamas people will realize <clears throat> you not only have this year to think about and next year, you've got the next hundred years to think about. And that folks will be wise and careful and not surrender any hope of reconciliation over the next century or two or five because of your immediate passions. That's very, very difficult to do but very important to do because we believe in reconciliation. The only answer, the only answer for the Israeli-Palestinian crisis is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you'll talk to any diplomat, anybody who really knows the situation on the ground in Israel or in Palestine, they'll tell you there is no answer. And of course, we believe part of what they're saying. There is no answer except in Jesus Christ. I remember at Lausanne 3 in Cape Town, South Africa, uh, uh, back in 2010, we had an Israeli and a Palestinian standing next to each other on the platform in front of 4,000 leaders from around the world. And they said it just as clearly. There's one answer. There's one reason that we love each other. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ who has done it for us. We're experts at this. We're the only ones who can solve the deepest crisis. How can you forgive a, a conflict that goes back 1,400 years where your parents have been taking out their parents and their parents have been taking out your parents? How do you solve that? You don't without the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we tackle this with clarity, 
and with hope. And we know that if people actually will put their faith in Jesus Christ, if they will actually follow Him, it will destroy the barriers, even the ancient barriers that men and women have put up between themselves. So let me mention a few things. Uh, just as I mentioned in this interim pastoring work I've been involved in, I went to a church where there were all kinds of relational outages. Uh, we formed a team of 14 people who were going to investigate all the outages in the church. And they found about 50 of them. 50 relationships that were out of sorts, were unreconciled. Eventually, that list comes to the session, the elders. And every one of those outages had an elder assigned to it. And every single one of those were intervened on. And the elders adopted a policy of zero tolerance for relational outages in the church. Wow, I was very impressed. And I'm thinking now in our day, it's exactly what we need to say. Zero tolerance for outages on relationships. It doesn't mean that you equally like everybody, but it does mean that you've got a responsible Christian relationship with everybody in the church. A, we've forgotten how to apologize. Today, here's what we think an apology is. I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. When you say something like that, what you're saying is this. The problem is not the sin I committed against you. The problem is your puny little feelings that got hurt. That's the problem. I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. It's demeaning. It's not an apology. It may be a true expression of sorrow. I'm sorry that your feelings are hurt. That's a legitimate thing to be sorrowful about, but it's not an apology. Here's an apology. Here's what I did against you, and I know this is what it cost you. I'm profoundly sorry. Will you forgive me? That's an apology. We've forgotten how to do this. We've forgotten our manners. We've substituted an apology for a demeaning comment about the other person's weak feelings. So here's under A. I'll just mention these quickly. A, one, take the initiative. Jesus said, go. If your brother has something against you, go. To confess what you've done is sin with no excuses. David said, I have sinned. Three, express genuine sorrow over the hurt you caused. So acknowledge the damage that you did, not just the sin you committed. Fourthly, make restitution as much as possible. I cheated you out of $10,000. Please give me the next six months and I'll get the $10,000 back to you but I still want you to forgive me for taking it in the first place. And five, ask for forgiveness. There are your steps. That's a Christian apology. We've got to learn how to do this again. So young men, we have children in your home, or those of us who have grandchildren, let's walk them through it. When they sin against their sibling, let's walk it through. Here's how you do it. We've forgotten how to apologize. B, we've forgotten how to confront Matthew 18, we first confront privately. I've got 17 steps of how to do that. We don't have time for that today. Secondly, we recruit a mature third party if needed. That's what Jesus says. You go privately to the person. You don't get it resolved. You bring a mediator with you the next time who is between the two of you and will help, help the two of you get reconciled. If that doesn't work, you take it to the church. Each church has the different forms of government. Presbyterian church, you take it to an elder and you ask them to get involved. That's what the elders were doing in this church I was just describing. Okay, so we've forgotten how to apologize. We've forgotten how to confront. Thirdly, C, we've forgotten how to forgive. So here's what usually goes. I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. Oh, it's okay. It's no problem. Now two guys consider, okay, well, we're, we're good. No, you're not. Because nobody's apologized and no one has given forgiveness. Forgiveness has not been granted. You've just said, oh, you're a louse, I'm a louse, we're both louses, that's it. I mean, that's better than nothing, I suppose. But here's what we do. Number one, we pursue the offender. Someone's offended you, especially if it's a brother. You must go to your brother. Now notice that Jesus puts the burden on both the offender and the offended. So you can be either one 
And he tells you in Matthew 5 in one case, Matthew 18 in the other, both of you all are supposed to go. So the initiative is with you on either side of the equation, whether you're offended or you offended somebody else. Secondly, we must forgive those who sincerely ask. So the person must ask you, will you please forgive me? The answer is, oh, that's okay. No, that's not the answer. The answer is, I forgive you. What does that mean when you forgive? Here's what it means. If I stole $10,000 from you, and then I go bankrupt, and I come to you and say, will you forgive me? And you say, I forgive you. What did that cost you? $10,000. You canceled the note. That's what you're doing when you forgive. You're canceling the debt. Now, does that mean that you're going to make me your comptroller? No. You've got more good sense than that. And not because I'm a preacher and don't know anything about numbers, but because I just stole 10000 from you. So you're not going to make me your comptroller. That's wisdom. But you are going to cancel the debt. And that's the way in all forgiveness. Uh, Nancy Lee DeMoss, I think, was speaking at First Evan some years ago, and she said 90% of the world's population has somebody difficult to forgive. And I know 90% of the people in this room, you've got someone in your mind right now difficult to forgive. It is difficult. Let me ask you this. Was it difficult for Jesus to forgive you? How difficult was it? We must forgive those and sincerely ask. And thirdly, we must forgive continually. You notice that after that Matthew 18 text that we referred to, Jesus now teaches a text on forgiveness. He says, Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Peter thought that was heroic. Jesus said, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. In other words, no end. Once again, you don't put the person in, in an area of responsibility where they're likely to commit the same sin again. You're not silly and foolish, but you cancel the debt and you do it over and over and over again. Now, you do this with your children. They've sinned against you more times than you could possibly count, and you've canceled the debt every time. That's the way you do it in the family of God. Fourthly, we must seek the forgiven person's best interests. A very high proportion of the American population wishes that people of the opposing party would die. The number is up around 20% of the population actually thinks that. They wish people of the other party would just get killed. We... Christian men seek the best interests of everybody. When the Jews were taken to Babylon, Jeremiah didn't say, pray for the shalom of all you Jewish people in Babylon, that wicked city, who took you into captivity. No, he says, pray for the shalom of Babylon. The people who killed your children and took you into captivity, pray for their shalom. Wow. And that's what Jesus taught us to do, to love our enemies. Fifthly, we must look to Christ for the power and motivation. Because Jesus tells that wonderful parable in Matthew 18 about the forgiveness of the servant who then didn't forgive his fellow servant. And Jesus makes it very clear that once you've been forgiven, the obvious obligation is that you issue forgiveness out of your heart to other people. Well, my mother told me to mind my manners. She went to be with the Lord five years ago, but I, I still have a mother, and so do you. St. Cyprian, a third century theologian from Carthage, once wrote, no one can have God for his father who has not the church for his mother. And our mother, the church, is saying to us, along with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, don't forget your manners. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the manner of life that you've given us in the gospel. And thank you for the provision that you've made for it, forgiving us already for all the sins we're going to commit today. They're already forgiven. And in that freedom and in that joy, we pray that you would enable us to walk more closely with you, to wear the gospel in our human relations, especially with those with whom we disagree. May we demonstrate to the world the reasonableness, the love and the kindness and the truthfulness of one who follows Jesus. 
We pray in His precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.